From the Manchester Evening News Arena in Manchester, England, HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing, where tonight, England's own Prince Nassim Hamed defends his featherweight title against a fellow Yorkshireman, undefeated Paul Ingle. It's scheduled for 12 rounds on a beautiful spring day in the northern England town of Manchester, about 40 miles down the road from Prince Nassim Hamed's hometown of Sheffield, a crowd of about 20,000, perhaps the largest indoor crowd ever to see a boxing match in England, fills this Manchester arena to watch their darling, Prince Nassim Hamed, against a man from nearby Scarborough, also in Yorkshire, Paul Ingle. They are both undefeated, and as Prince Nassim said to us yesterday, somebody's O is going to go. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lapley. We welcome you to this special edition of HBO's World Championship Boxing, the first appearance on these airwaves and in the ring for Prince Nassim Hamed since he was forced to go 12 full rounds to earn a unanimous decision against Ireland's Wayne McCullough last October 31, Halloween night. That decision victory for the Prince increased his unbeaten record to 31 and 0, but ended his knockout streak at 18 consecutive knockouts and perhaps rubbed off a little of the mystique which has helped to make him one of the most entertaining, if not the most entertaining, fighter in boxing. Working with me, as always, HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Larry, when the Prince first came to HBO, we all knew the fighter against whom he was matched, Kevin Kelly. Likewise, we've been able since then to recognize Wilfredo Vasquez and Wayne McCullough, both of them former world champions. But who is Paul Ingle, and what is he doing fighting Prince Nassim Hamed? Imagine coming all this way, Jim, to watch two Yorkshiremen duke it out. <laughs> What we want to know is whether Ingle is going to be a Yorkshire pudding swallowed whole by one punch from the hard-punching champion, or whether he's going to be a Yorkshire terrier who hunts the champion down like a good ratter should. Ingle, in some ways, is a typical English fighter, perhaps a little bit better, but we wonder whether he has the strength to work on this level. He's tough, he's well-schooled, and he looks like he hasn't been in the sun in six years. To withstand Hamed's vaunted punch, he's trained himself in unusual ways, jumping into the icy rivers around here, going to an army course to train, and even camping out on the moors with his pet whippets and other beasts of prey. The question again is, can he take that punch? If he can, and it's a big if, we might have a titanic upset. By way of underlining the style difference, the lifestyle difference between himself and the Prince, Ingle likes to say, he has two Bentleys and a Lamborghini, I have two whippets and a ferret. Well, working with us as always, no ferret this man, two-time world heavyweight champion George Foreman, a big fan of the Prince's entertainment value. And George, there's no more unorthodox fighter to be found in the sport than the wild swinging knockout artist, the Prince. But since last we saw him, fired his promoter, fired his manager, fired the trainer who had taken him through 17 years of his career, has hired to replace Patty Ingle, his former trainer, a guy named Oscar Suarez, who has been working in Patterson, New Jersey for 18 years, but we've never seen him. And now Suarez says that he's making changes in the Prince's style. He did so well doing it the wrong way. Is there any value to trying to make him do it the right way? I don't think so. Like I said earlier, it would be like teaching Einstein to count on his fingers again. You don't want to mess with something so successful. This guy's got everything. He's a little unorthodox, but he's a phenomenon, and you don't want to mess with those kind of guys. But if you want to mess with them, this is the right time for your opponent because all of these distractions can cause for a great upset. Well, let's see what happens as Paul Ingle looks to take advantage of the main chance against Prince Nassim Hamed. Here's the tale of the tape for the two Yorkshiremen. You see that Ingle is one year older. They were more or less contemporaries years ago on the British National Amateur Boxing Team before Ingle, not Prince Nassim, Ingle went to the Olympics in Barcelona in 1992 as the flyweight representative. Ingle with a two-inch height advantage. They weighed in within a half pound of the limit. Tonight, Ingle weighs 137 to Prince's 136 as they enter the ring. Six and a half inch reach advantage for Ingle, but will that help him to stay away from Hamed's power shots? Punch that numbers, Larry. These are the numbers from their last fights. You can see they're vaguely similar, but of course Hamed is a much bigger puncher. Interestingly, 
Ingle, although he has a reach advantage, is a very aggressive fighter and doesn't use that reach advantage. And here are the, here are the power punches, the significant edge that Hamed has. It's a significant edge because he is unorthodox, throws punches from awkward angles that opponents frequently don't see. And rules of the bout from the avid traveler who has eaten fish and chips three times in the last two days, Harold Letterman. <laughs> the Prince the same Hamed, Paul Engel fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the standardized rules of the Association of Boxing Commissions. There is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight, and you cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the 12th and final round. Jeff, perhaps the most interesting part of his walkout is that Engel threatens to do it twice tonight if he's kept waiting too long for Hamed in the ring. But it looks like he's got some stuff going on for himself. <laughs> Trying to upstage Prince Nassim's anticipated, customary, overly elaborate entrance. Paul Engel produces his own theatrics. Well, he's called calls himself the Hunter, so I guess we just saw some machine bullets, machine gun bullets outline his attempt here to upstage the Prince. I like it. You're becoming a fan of these showy entrances, uh, Larry? I like showy entrances. I think that's something boxing can borrow from Rathlin as long as what goes on in the ring is honest. <laughs> well, I wonder if uh, Frank Maloney has started his stopwatch yet. Ingalls manager Frank Maloney says he'll put a stopwatch on his own fighter's entrance and then they will, in effect, give the Prince the same amount of time to get into the ring, and if he doesn't get into the ring within the allotted time period established by the stopwatch, then Ingle will, as Larry mentioned, leave the ring, go back to the dressing room, and wait to come back out again after the Prince has already made his entrance. We'll see if they'll follow through with that plan. Frank Maloney, the man who is ostensibly holding the stopwatch, you'll recognize as also the manager of world heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis. Lewis isn't here tonight, incidentally. He spent the weekend in New York for the United States Boxing Writers Association dinner. The Prince called Engel ugly in one of the fight promotion ads, and Maloney said the Prince must not have any mirrors in his house. <laughs> There it is. Engel makes his entrance in a fatigue outfit befitting his paramilitary approach to training. He calls himself Jim the Yorkshire Hunter. This is hunting gear. He recognized referee Joe Cortez, one of the finest referees in the sport, as he stands in front of Engel and begins individual instructions. There's the record for Paul Engel. 21 wins, no losses, no draws, 15 KOs. A lot of people say, well, his most significant opponent was Billy Hardy. Prince Nassim knocked out Billy Hardy in one round. And we can see Maloney saying they took six minutes to come into the ring. He's got a stopwatch in his hand. And there's Maloney holding the stopwatch, so... You presume that Maloney has now established for purposes of this camp. Well, you know, and he has a point. He says, what the time limit is. I've warmed up my fighter in the dressing room. We're coming out here. It's just not fair to have him freeze for 10 or 15 minutes. You saw what happened to Kevin Kelly in Madison Square Garden as he stood in the ring and watched and waited and watched and waited for the Prince finally to enter. But I would, like, I would like to have an opponent leave the ring, make the walk way back out and come out again. That would be great. So I'm at you to try to exploit that. So you think they, they, they'd be cutting off their noses to spite there their face if they do what Maloney plans? George, it's not that long of a walk. Yeah, but that's the kind of walk, <laughs> an emotional walk that you don't want your fighter to do but once. Fair it's point. all about emotions. Prince Nassim, incidentally, well aware of Maloney's announced plan to pull his fighter out of the ring, and 
a, a master of gamesmanship, or at least certainly he sees himself that way, has not yet left his dressing room. I guess he's daring Maloney and Engel to follow through on their threat. Last Halloween in Atlantic City, Nassim cut short his entrance by several planned minutes. Seemed to sort of cut it off in midstream and just walk directly to the ring as if to say, ah, I'm a little tired of the show this evening. Later admitted that he was out of sorts coming into the fight. He knew that he was arguing with his trainer. He said that he was poorly nourished and not well conditioned for the fight and also on the wrong time clock because he had only gotten to the United States four days prior to the assigned date in Atlantic City. And maybe that had something to do with his cutting short the entrance. Maybe he knew that he wasn't about to produce one of those explosive signature performances. Well, I think Wayne McCullough had more to do with it than he did. Yep. If Engel is as tough as McCullough, we could have some fun here tonight. So Maloney, apparently timing Hamed's entrance starting now. And that would seem to indicate that in a couple minutes, Maloney's going to turn to his fighter and say, let's get out of here, and they're going to leave the ring and go back to the dressing room. You know, in the day we fought for the world titles back in the 60s and 70s, we'd have to wait for a long time anyway. The champion would come in, then we'd put the gloves on in the ring, we'd tape the gloves. So there's nothing unusual about waiting in the ring. What about Naz's entrance tonight, uh, Larry? What's in the offing? Well, I've heard it has something to do with automobiles. He's in an automobile buff, although in his his new image as being more and modest now, than he used to be, his he's stripped to the down ring, to just the an Aston Martin champion. here and a Prince Porsche there. entrance begins with triple princes well the prince likes to do a solo act when he gets into the ring he may have to do one Ahmed, I've heard, is getting a reported $7 million for this fight tonight. Most Whoa. of it from overseas you guys sources to of television, television revenue. This is why he gets all that money. Whoa. I can't wait to say that. a new choreographer, as well as a new trainer, a new promoter, and a new manager. All right, let's get to the music, man. Let's get some dancing. Come on, come on. Let's see some dancing. All right. Up to the mic. Prince seems 
disappointed that he's not getting the response he had hoped to get with this entrance. Well, not a lot of people can see what's going on, to be honest with you. The sight lines aren't such that they can all see it. What do you think he's going to do when he gets to the ring and he turns out to be the only fighter there? Maybe he'll leave. Go back to the dressing room. Oh, here comes Engel. So, George, you would say that he just played into the Prince's hands. That's right. That's the that's one thing you want to do. You want to be solid and everything you do is strictly basic. You move out of that, you're moving into his territory and he's the king of it. In case you haven't seen him before, get ready for the flip over the top rope into the ring. The coup de grace, as it were, of this entrance. as usual for Prince Nassim Hamed. We mentioned the new trainer, Oscar Suarez, originally from Puerto Rico. Last 28 years in Patterson, New Jersey. Here comes Paul Engel back into the ring. Prince Nassim with record of 31-0, 28 knockouts, but new promoter, new trainer, maybe a new in-the-ring style. Emmanuel Stewart has also been hired on for the night to advise Suarez and Hamed. Ostensibly, he'll only talk to the trainer, but you got to wait and see. Emmanuel's not shy if something goes wrong. There's Suarez, the new trainer. There's Manny Stewart walking right in front of him. And Michael Buffer waiting for his cue to provide the official introductions. Emmanuel Stewart is here because in a later bout, actually the walkout bout here tonight, his most famous fighter ever, Tommy Hearns, is fighting against Nate Miller in a cruiserweight bout. He was going to be on the scene anyway. It was apparently the Prince's idea to have him involved in what has suddenly become a pretty strong corner beyond the relatively unknown trainer, Stewart, and brand new cut man, Al Gavin, one of the very best at his trade. The Prince has never been cut, he says, but he hired Gavin anyway. There's Engel. And here comes Michael Butler. Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Manchester Evening News Arena here in Manchester, England, where tonight, Barry Hearn and Charles Muniz of Matchroom, in association with Prince Promotions, assalamu alaikum to boxing fans around the world, along with your undisputed, undefeated king of beer, Budweiser, the genuine article, are proud to present 12 rounds of boxing for the WBO featherweight Championship of the World! Sanctioned by the British Boxing Board of Control, General Secretary John Morris, and the World Boxing Organization, President and Supervisor ringside for tonight's bout, Francisco Barcarcel. Timekeeper at the bell, Barry Pinder. The three judges scoring this bout on a 10-point must system will be John Coyle from England. Roy Francis, also from England. Michael Pernick from the United States. And when the bell rings, your referee in charge of the action, working for the 113th time in a world title bout, Joe Cortez. And now, boxing fans, are you ready? Manchester, Sheffield, and Scarborough, are you? Ready! For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching.
watching around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing combat camouflage and weighing in at 125 and one half pounds or eight stone 13 and one half pounds. He brings an outstanding professional record to this ring consisting of 22 bouts with 21 victories, 15 contests ending inside the distance by knockout and he has one draw. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the former British featherweight champion, former Commonwealth featherweight champion, and former European featherweight champion from Scarborough, England, the challenger, the undefeated Yorkshire Hunter, across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing a leopard trimmed with Adidas, weighing 126 pounds or nine stone even. His perfect professional record consists of 31 bouts, all 31 bouts by victory, 29 of those victories by knockout, and he has captured two world titles. Tonight, he makes his 12th defense of his world championship and he plans to maintain his recognition by many as, pound for pound, one of the best in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, from Sheffield, England, presenting the undefeated WBO featherweight champion of the world, man of the British Empire, Greek Nephi. Gentlemen, we went over the rules in our dressing room. I expect a good, clean fight. Obey my commands at all times. Give me good sportsman like conduct. Understood? Any questions on this side here? Any questions here? All right, touch them up. When this is over, Jim, are we going to be seeing, singing Paul Garfunkel's Are You Going to Scarborough Fair for Engel? Or from the musical Hair? for the champion Manchester, Manchester, England across the Atlantic Sea. I am a genius, genius. That would be uh, Art Garfunkel and Paul Simon. Simon and Garfunkel. And round one begins. You caught a brief ringside glimpse of Nassim's father, Sal Hamed. And to go back to the early discussion with George Foreman about a change in style, the trainer says that he wants Hamed to be better balanced in a tighter envelope, boxing more conventionally out of a southpaw stance, George. And I hate the thought of that. It would be like, like I said earlier, sending Einstein to Harvard to get an English degree just so he could do his math. This guy's got the whole package. You should let him alone. You can see why Engel is regarded as a pretty good defensive fighter. His head movement, his hands held high. Conventional wisdom is that fighters revert to form. Form for Prince Nassim is to launch wild shots from odd angles while avoiding his opponent's punches in the least conventional ways, ducking his head backward or from side to side. He's now, edge, enormous punching power with either hand. Now I like what he's just done. He did something stupid, and that's what he does best. <laughs> you want to call the other guy out to do the other things that he can't do. He's had a career of beating basic boxers. Why change and make him a basic boxer? After failing to come through on a prediction of a third round KO against McCullough last October, Prince Nassim stayed away from any specific round prediction for a knockout in this fight, but as his confidence grew in the last couple days, he did say, don't blink. The Prince looking for an opening in that shell defense from Engel. Hey, uh, Harold.
Harold Letterman. They're wearing different colored gloves. Is there a story there? Yeah, Jim. At the rules meeting, the champion picks first. He picked a brand new pair of red gloves. They didn't have another pair of brand new red gloves left. So Paul Lingle got stuck with the yellow. Don't blink. Lingle goes down on the left hand. Only the second time in his career he's been knocked down. I guess the punting power remains intact. The power is there. Now you look, Joe Cortez, when you see him in the ring, that means the champion is not worried about losing his crown. But this man has integrity. He should be crowned the referee, the, 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 the best referee as far as integrity is in count. Hard right hand by Hamed. Drives Eagle into the rope. Nassim has landed some power wallops in the first round. Two left hands and a right. And now Ingle lands a right hand coming back. As you know, As has been down before plenty of times. He was down three times against Kevin Kelly in his first appearance on HBO. But as he says to us, hey, I always bounce back up. scored the knockdown against Engel. Nassim trying to fight from a conventional stance, left to the body, left to the head. Beautiful two-punch combination. And as promised us, more body shots than we've seen in the past, and the left to the body there perfectly set up the power shot. In round one, Prince Nassim landing 18 of 52 punches by CompuBox number, 17 of the power shots. Ingle, five of only 38. And Ingle had promised us that he would throw 140 punches around. No problem, he said. 38 punches in the first round, only 102 short of his predicted number. throw a lot of punches against Prince Nassim George because he stays at a distance and dodges from side to side. He'll slide his lead uh, foot ahead and then slide it back to you so he keeps in position to put that foot right back up there and hit you. And I like that. Slide in, slide out. Nassim misses with the right hand. He's only thrown a few jabs. Engel just has not been able to set up a mounted offense because he cannot or will not get close. This after claiming to us that he would come in and put his face on Nassim's face and try to fight him in a phone booth. It only took one left hand to alter that strategy. Once you taste that kind of power from a guy like that, you got to protect yourself. Incidentally, with regard to the use of the term title here, Naz doesn't own one of the three more notorious titles given by the well-known so-called governing bodies. The one he owns is a sort of off-brand, but in terms of his public impact and his accomplishment, he's the number one featherweight in the sport. That's why we designate him as the champion. He is definitely the champion. He's better beware that Engel has come here to win. Even though you knock him out, you can't play with him. comes in close, Naz lands an uppercut, and you see the fluidity with which Prince Nassim is able to throw his combinations with power shots when you get in close. You have to be careful, Engel is using elbows a little here. Oh, he said he'll use everything, elbows, forehead, he said you can't mess around in there, you got to do anything you can to hurt the guy. I don't like the idea of a guy gloves on it and ungloved elbows. I think for a lot of guys out there who would like to be referees, they should really watch Joe Cortez. Most you see him out of the picture, <laughs> which is the best picture you want to see for a referee. I do remember him getting into the picture to count out Michael Moore on November 5, 1994. Oops. Up 
uppercut lands for Nassim, backs Inkle up again. Inkle is starting to use his footwork left and right, and that's what I would do. Anything that Nassim does tonight, remember, he's half-heartedly doing it. He's messed up in training camp. Featherweight Championship of Yorkshire and the world. Okay, that's good, okay, baby? But remember, that job has to be a little bit more sharper than that, right? Mm -hmm. You're being a little lazy with it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, remember, you don't have to fall into his fight, okay? You keep doing your fight, okay? Now, like I say, two hands to the body, okay, babe? Now, we have to keep it down, remember? We have to keep it down, yeah. right? So, we have to be looking a little bit more sharper than that, all right? And yeah. pick them, pick them nice. Okay, pick this right now. Okay, pick them nice. And remember, we don't have one hand, all right? We got three hands, okay, baby? <coughs> okay? And we're gonna yeah. turn them just a little bit. We don't need to reach with them. Just turn them a little bit, all right, baby? And boom, okay? Then we go with the motion, okay, baby? Mm -hmm. So, we're gonna go to the bank now, right? What a contrast to last October 31 when Brendan Ingle barely tried to speak to Hamed and Hamed made clear that he wouldn't listen to him if he did. Tonight, listening very intently to the new voice in his corner, Oscar Suarez. But George, you spent 17 years listening to one voice in the corner. How strange it, is it for the Prince now to be listening to an entirely new guy? It's shock. It's going to take more than just sitting in the corner. It just does not sink in because the guy gets to be part of you, that voice. This guy has not become a part of him yet. As you see, he hasn't thrown one body shot as he was told. Now you see one. But it was back to the head. Like, I believe I know what I'm doing. He spent his whole life polishing a style which is completely and entirely his own. There isn't another fighter in the sport who attacks in exactly the same way as Prince Nassim Hamed. Suarez wants more conventionality. The Prince just wants to smile and knock people for a loop with power shots. Like that. Engel is really smart when he's not doing anything. He's moving his head. You gotta keep your hands up at all times and tuck your chin with a puncher like this. Engel keeping his right glove pinned to his cheek to guard against the left hand. And that time, Hamad punches right through the guard. And lands a right. Engel just hasn't been able to mount any kind of attack. Well, what makes Hamad special is not just his power, but his combination of the power, the quickness, the eyesight that sees everything coming. That's right. The movement. The eyesight. I like that. The reflexes. Yeah, he watches the everything. This. The fact that the other fighter stands in front of him, having been trained to fight conventionally, and wonders what in the world this guy thinks he's doing. <laughs> can't believe how effective it is. Breaks a few, a few rules here and there, but let me tell you, he makes up for it with the power. It's a little like standing on the practice tee in golf and watching somebody with a horrendous swing and saying, oh, I'm going to tear this guy up on the course. And then after five holes, you're four shots down and you're thinking, what happened? Engel is starting to go to the body just a little now. Starting to get through. Hamed comes back with a three-punch combination. He's wanting to go to the body with a combination, but Hamid has got to understand that your fighter must be coming to you to be able to land that shot. You can't go to him and throw combinations to the body. And then ducking, smiling, firing the left hand, just missing. Engel misses wildly with the left, and Hamed effectively counters him inside. Prince Nassi delighting his fans in the crowd through the first three rounds with some vintage Nassim moves. Now the Prince is starting to throw away a lot of his strength and endurance by throwing such hard shots. Just oh, oh. Well, he's extremely knockout conscious, and tonight, maybe more so than ever. How you feeling? How you feeling? Great. Good, good. Take a deep breath, baby. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Excellent. Excellent. Now, we rushed there a little bit, all right? Which you didn't need to. Okay, baby? You didn't need to do that, all right? Remember, you keep to the plan, okay, baby? Now, every time you throw that hook there, baby, I want to see it to the body, okay? Because he's there for you. Automatically, he's right there for you. Uh -huh. Okay, baby? So we have to do it. Okay? Uh-huh. 
Now, again. Again, baby. We still. Eagles trainer is named Steve Pollard. Himself a veteran fighter. Engel is getting $500,000 for this fight. By far the biggest purse of his career. He's also bet $10,000 on himself. 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds, which is about $16,000. That bet doesn't look too good right now. Odds of 11 to 2. If he wins the bet, he wins 55,000 pounds to go on top of his purse. Harold, how do you have it through three? Jim, three to nothing. 30 to 26. Prince Nassim Ahmed. Give him an extra point for the knockdown around one. Certainly he's winning this fight. A clean punch for the left-hand stance. He's murdering good defense, good effect on the of this fight of Prince as well. I think the big mistake, the corner talking too much. You want to tell this guy, fight your fight. Don't forget to get into that body and let him alone. He did ask for body shots again. And if Emmanuel Stewart is playing an active role in that corner, he's doing it during the rounds, talking to Suarez. Actually, he's seated on the opposite side of the corner from Suarez. So for the moment, there can be no conversation between Emmanuel and Oscar Suarez, though he's talking to Suarez's brother now, who's a chief second. But Emmanuel Stewart so far not talking to the Prince. Left hand lands for Nassim. And the number. He was caught by a straight right hand himself. Yeah, first time he took a good punch to the head. And there he goes to the body. But it's not necessary that he integrate all of that body punching into his style. It let it come in the flow. You want him to head hunt the Yorkshire, yeah. you're the Yorkshire hunter? Yeah, go, go after him, and then if you're able to get a body shot, just remind him of it. But don't have him going out doing things he's not accustomed to. There's a trickle of blood from the right nostril of the prince. With right hand counter for Nassim. Ingle becoming all much his, more aggressive now. He keeps all his punches up. He's in success. Exactly what you're saying, George. You think that Nassim's a lot better off if he just follows his instincts yeah. in there because you can almost see him trying to think his way through what his new trainer wants him to do. Yeah, see, when you're thinking body punting, you automatically bend your face down. That's why you see the bleeding of the nose bowing into these little jabs, subtle jabs. So Engel begins to mount an attack after having been frustrated through the first three rounds by the elusiveness of the Prince. In the last round, he got up to 57 thrown punches. This will be the first round in which he's landed a double-figure number of punches. Engel must be in great shape to be going at this rate. Boxing on HBO next Saturday night. Boxing After Dark presents one of its all-time best lineups. As lightweight champion Shane Mosley takes on John Brown. What a fight! Plus a battle between two well-known lightweight warriors, Ivan Robinson and Angel Manfredi. In May, it only gets better. When Oscar De La Hoya, coming off his split decision victory over Ike Quarte, good left hook Oscar, defends his welterweight title against veteran Obakar. Also featured super featherweight champion Floyd Mayweather against Goyo Vargas. Then one week later on the 29th, boxing's other premier welterweight champion, Felix Trinidad, last seen dominating Brunel Whitaker in Madison Square Garden. This time he'll meet Vincent Petway in San Juan, Puerto Rico. April and May boxing on HBO. for the first time, okay, we can see Emmanuel to Stewart beginning to talk to oh, Prince Nassim Ahmed between rounds. Ingle landed 13 of 57 punches in round four. That's by far his best round in the bout. Prince Nassim, 18 of 65 by CompuBox numbers. Most of them power shots as usual. Ingle is doing something I like. You get a a guy basically who's a boxer who possess a punch, make him come after you. Throws away a lot of punching power, make him follow you around. Get a rhythm to it. He hit you with two to the right.
right, then he threw a power shot. All of that rhythm factor that he has is gone. He lands two lefts, including one to the body. Engel comes back with a couple of left hands as Nassim stalked and looked for a chance to throw a right. Prince Nassim changing his lead foot from time to time. Now goes into a conventional stance. On paper, he's a southpaw. In reality, he's whatever he feels like at any given moment. Yeah, but he's the rhythm that he possessed. He would always do one, two, three something. Now he's just waiting for one shot here and there. Engel himself is a natural southpaw. Writes and brushes his teeth with his left hand, but fights, as you can see, out of the conventional stance, and that helps his jab and his hook. Uppercut was blocked by Engel's glove, but he lands the left as Engel continues to stalk and look for bigger opportunities. Naz missing with the uppercuts, but if he lands one, he's going to score. Engel reaching the fire right to the body. Seems to feel as though he's weathered the early power score. Remember, Prince Nassim knocked Engel down with a left hand in round one. A double left, really, one to the body and one to the face. Slight welt under the right eye of the Prince. A lot of that has to do with him reaching in for those body shots. Everything else he does is sort of reflex, but when he goes to the body, it's a reach forward. Crowd kind of sitting back in its seats now as the action slows in round five. Naz going back to his elusiveness to stay away from Ingle, who landed enough in the fourth and fifth to get Naz's attention. Now Naz is doing his thing. Put your hands down, relax. That was boring. <laughs> Tonight we had some excitement. Junior Jones fighting on the undercard against a little-known Coventry Englishman named Richard Ebbett. In the first round, Ebbett, with the tiger-striped hair, put Junior down. And in round four, already behind on the scorecards, Jones was penalized a point for holding by English referee Paul Thomas. In round eight, they stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and went at each other, and Ebbett landed a right hand that again put Junior Jones seemingly in trouble. But in round 11, trailing on two scorecards and with his career hanging in the balance, the former two-time world champion, Junior Jones, landed a clean left-hand shot that put Richard Evett down and out. And he won the fight, although as you see, going into the 11th, Jones trailed on two of the three scorecards and seemed in our eyes headed toward defeat. Yeah, he looked like a shot fighter for 10 rounds, but found some ammunition, reloaded, and unloaded. And landed a shot in the dark to salvage, for the moment, his career. <laughs> Round six, Prince Nassim with a whitewash so far on Harold Letterman's card. He's won every one of the five rounds as we come toward the midway point of the bout. When you boasted of your greatness, when you told everybody you're the second coming of Muhammad Ali, you create a very high standard, and that's how he's going to be judged. He could win this fight 12 rounds to none, but if he doesn't put more hurt on Engel, doesn't stop him, it will not be a, a victory as far as the media and the fans are concerned. And will it be a moral victory for Paul Engel? Well, of course. I mean, it's a win. You go on to the next fight, can't knock everybody out. But Prince has established himself in such a way that that is the high expectations of him. Did McCullough, though he won very few rounds, get a moral victory for going the distance against the Prince last Halloween? Well, in a sense, he's earned a fight with Eric Morales, the wonderful junior featherweight champion in May. So that showing uh, helped him. Now remember, Muhammad Ali got a lot of decisions. What he do was the shuffle in between the rounds to make him keep himself popular. The knockouts don't come for a lot. 
it's almost a fluke that happens beyond your expectation. Yeah, well, when he had 18 in a row, George. I've had 30 of them in a row. <laughs> doesn't mean a thing. Winning that big W, that's what we come to see. No, I agree with you, we're, but we're talking about a fighter who is, whose popularity is what counts. It's what puts people into the seats to want to watch him. George, you had 30 knockouts in a row, and Nassim is landing a lot of shots in this round, incidentally. You had 30 KOs in a row, and the highest knockout percentage of any heavyweight champion. Can you honestly tell me you were just as happy with the 12-round decision victories? Yeah, you. I, I went to 12 rounds distance with uh, Evander Holyfield, for instance. It seemed like I got a hand up because I did it. So people are not looking for a knockout. They dress up, put on their suits, and sit down and watch a fight. If they get a knockout, good. What tells the story? We'll see after the night with the ratings. How many seats were about to Well, I think it sort of depends on how you sell it. You never went out of your way, as the Prince does, to style yourself a knockout artist and say you were going to dominate your opponent. The body shot did it again. Second vicious left-hand body shot of the evening for Nassim. And you can't catch his win. That's a hard shot to recover from. Only 10 seconds left in the round. Let's see if Naz launches a wild one. Went back to the body. With both hands to the body. And really hurts Engel as the sixth round comes to a close. That's what they came to see, George. That's right. That's right. But they would, would love to see it for 12 it, rounds. I'm you, right, Eddie, that's what yeah. we want, okay? Deep breath. Come on, give me deep breath. Give me deep breath. Come on, come on. Give me deep breath. Give me deep breath. Ah, shit. So now we're having fun, okay, baby? Now we're having fun, okay? Take another deep breath. Another deep, baby. Come on, another deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Jeff. Hang on, I'll cut, right? No. Left to the body, something we didn't see the Prince do much of in the past. There's no opening up top because of the defensive angle. That body punch put a hurt look on Engel's face. And it was done right in the floor of things. He didn't aim for it. He just let it happen. That facial expression from Engel tells you everything you need to know about the natural punching power of Prince Nassim. Some fighters just have heavy hands, and he is a case in point. What we wonder now is whether he'll bring his right hand down and leave his jaw open. <laughs> Harold, how do you have it? Through six. Jim, 60 to 50 through six rounds to death on Prince to see him have Jim, let me tell you something. The knockdown, he, he knocked him down with a left hook. That means he was fighting out of the right-handed stance. He switches ready to lefty very often, and he's very effective at it. He's now back in the southpaw stance, so left hands here are crosses. Either way, they're effective. And while he does generate power with the right hand, the more we watch him, the more it seems that the left is his thunder and light. Ingo landed a nice right hand while, while we were chatting, talking heads here. <laughs> Tough kid, Ingo. He's keeping his gloves up high, so a lot of the power is going off being absorbed in the gloves. Well, and you might have heard Naz bragging to the new trainer about his body shots as he went back went back uh, after round six. He's sort of like a kid with a new toy with these body shots. Wow. Fascinated to see how easily he can hurt Engel to the ribcage. There's the old Naz. Wild, off balance, and effective. crowd cheers mightily, and Naz smiles as Engel lands a right hand. It was a good right hand by Engel. All those body shots. When he doubles up with the left hand and comes back to the body, he is doing some damage to Paul Engel. Engel lands a left and another left. So Ingle making a nice little comeback in this round after having been knocked down in round six. Ready Naz's nose once again. Now, the Prince is using his rhythm. Goes one side with power, same side with power, and then come back with another shot. With another hand. And Ingle starting to tire as he landed a shot 
well below Maz's waist on his hip. But he doesn't tire much, does he? Keeps those feet going. High intensity, rapid pace. He just can't throw as many punches as he expected to throw against Prince Nassim. And when you throw that many body punches that the Prince has thrown, you bound to land on those elbows a few times. By the time this fight is over, he's going to have some sore hands. He says that he broke his left hand as early as the third round against Wayne McCullough, though we know of no procedure or split that he wore after the fight. That's when you're in danger. You're getting underneath Welch, you've got to close it up and then start ramming in. Start ramming in, don't be gentle, be rough. Don't be looking <laughs> gentle, this is a looking man's game. Get in there and whack the punch. Elbow, shoulders, the lock. Check his can. balance, check his balance and step on him. Check his balance and step on him. His mouth is open like a train. He's only trying in Watch him, watch him. He's yeah. getting frustrated to block it. I'm telling you, you're frustrating him because he can't hit you. He's trying to put the bombs <laughs> on. Now he's trying to just flick off and he's trying to measure you up. Just keep that head moving, keep feigning him off and join him. Start telling him. You heard from Ingles' corner, they're very excited. That was probably Ingles' first round. And you heard Emmanuel Lewis in the Prince's corner saying, you got to stand there closer and you got him, which is just what he did. Yeah, if you're a ringside judge and you were looking hard for a round to give to Ingle, round seven would probably have been your choice. Bunch stat numbers, Hamad landed 26 of 64, Ingle 16 of 61. So at least he was in the round. Emmanuel Stewart and Prince Nassim both claim that they have no plans to do any future business together, but... Here's Emmanuel in the corner tonight. Let's see what happens down the road. Naz is pretty good friends with heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis and says that he spoke to Lewis just three days ago as he got ready for this fight. Ingle caught the Prince napping a little bit. That's what happens when your corner tells you to get in there and go throw straight punches, get a little closer. You start thinking about all of this foolishness and you find yourself waiting for something. You hit yourself. What did happen in the floor thing? Prince Nassim produced two eighth-round knockouts in his career. He knocked out both Steve Robinson and Tom Boo Boo Johnson in round eight. He had an 11th-round knockout of Manuel Medina back in 1996. Those are the only three knockouts which have come this late in about. And now Joe Cortez stops the action to allow Ingle to recover from low blows. Okay. I think it was the mouthpiece. Oh, that's it, the mouthpiece. Okay, excuse the Prince. me. Prince's mouthpiece replaced. <laughs> you see, when a corner man tell you to do something, sometimes you got to stop what you were doing and wait and look for it. You got to be careful how you say it. It's not what you say, but how you say it. from the look on his face between rounds, I'm not sure Ingle felt as encouraged as his corner did by the events of round seven. Well, that's the job of the corner, is to make you feel like you're winning the fight. You can lose every round, but the corner said, boy, you're doing great. Something can happen. Did Dick Sadler used to do that for you? No, I didn't go many rounds. <laughs> Ingle, Ingle's the kind of kid who would start a fight in an empty room. He really wants to try to do it. But it's very hard to do what you'd like to do against a fighter of Nassim's style, power, and quickness. Yeah, he, he really wants to fight. Good right hand by hand. Nass slowing down a little bit in this round. And just as the bell sounds, premiering Tuesday, April 20, we'll bring you the most recent edition of Real Sports with Brian Gumbel.
some of the stories to be featured. NASCAR, if it's the most popular spectator sport in the United States, and the numbers say so, then why are there so few black faces on the track or in the stands? Also, an investigation into the billion dollar business of counterfeit golf clubs. Only a billion? Plus a look at pitcher David Cohn, quickly developing into one of baseball's most outspoken citizens. Real sports, where nothing is out of bounds. Yeah, because it bothers him. He doesn't know how to have a jail coming from a south coast. Uh -huh. It's different if he was picking it and returning, but he doesn't do anything. Yeah, baby. Just, okay. just keep playing with it with the jail, but you just, just start it with it. Ahmed has found something with the body punch. The only way to go when a fighter is protecting his head that way. But right after that punch, Ahmed lost his mouthpiece. And if you were listening, you noticed that the, uh, the gag order is off for Emmanuel Stewart, who is now talking a blue streak to Prince Nassim Hamed. He tried his best to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the most fascinating thing about this is, is, is that he's not getting paid for this. Stewart is the kind of guy who would go and do a round for someone for free all the time. Yeah, but like Angelo Dundee, they love this. A couple of fighters who were paying him a lot of money decided they didn't want to pay him all that money anymore. There are many who believe Emmanuel Stewart is the best trainer in boxing. There are at least as many who believe he is the best self-promoter among trainers. All of the above. Ankle busier and busier now as we get into the later rounds. Nassim hot-shotting but slowing his own pace. Well, he's having some problems with his bleeding. A lot of that, he has to pay the price for all of that body hunting early on. And if the decision victory over McCullough love, rubbed a little of the bloom off of Nassim Hamed's rose, what would two straight root-going performances do? Still wobbling a little bit from the left hand. Body shot from Ahmed. Prince Nassim a little bit more active, but not so intense that he seems to indicate he's desperately trying to finish. Surely he knows he's well ahead of the bout. He is sold on body punching this time. Isn't he though? Yes. And Cortez is doing a great job of forcing this fight and staying out of the way. Cortez is a terrific referee. Yeah, I totally agree with you about that. He handled the Nassim McCullough fight in Atlantic City as well. Folks, a fight breaking out here. Nassim's face starting to look like a like bloody a ass. Like a fighter, yeah. Now for the first time we see footwork by Nassim. Nothing wrong with moving out of the way. Let's remember that at the start of this round, that Emmanuel Stewart told him to stand in there and go. <laughs> All of a sudden, the prince has decided, wait, let me get out of here. Because <laughs> look what happened when I stood in there. He's got a bloody nose, got a bloody back. Right. When you start passing blood out of your mouth and nose like that, you have a problem bleeding, I mean, breathing. And right. that's what is happening now. And, and he's not used to it. He's never been cut. So he, he's not particularly accustomed to tasting or seeing his own blood. It's a new experience for him. And Ingo celebrates the appearance of the blood. And Hamid shook his head, saying to good round. Everything is okay, okay? Don't worry about it. Hey, now, good? this is when the chatter should stop in the corner. I'm going to say we lost that round. Yeah, I okay? Okay. You got to go through the middle. You got to wide open gap. Shoot that blood. Trainer telling Engel, give it a little bit of time, don't come right out. 
as the round goes on, put the put more pressure on. Harold out of it's going through nine. 88, 81, seven rounds to two. Prince the seam Hamad. He's got a seven-point lead, Jim. Paul Lingle's got to do something dramatic in the last three rounds. Watch the Prince's right jab. Jump with this can't make him a if it's a back end today. You know what a back end the guy. And watch the late hits that Douglas Dingle Lingle Lingle. You can't hit him after the first thing Lingle. For well, the first time in the fight, Ingle, by CompuBox numbers, had the edge in power shots in round number nine. So he's won at least a couple of rounds, or so it would appear. How close are the judges' scorecards? Sometimes closer than Harold's. Two judges from England tonight, one from Florida. Florida, I should say, in the USA. A lot of this has to do with the wrong guys in your corner talking too much. Well, you heard Emmanuel Stewart say, fire the left-hand shot straight up the middle, and Prince Nassim just tried two straight left hands up the middle. All right, and Ingles, Ingles' trainer, Steve Pollard, said it's going to be dangerous as you go in. He knows that this is the most dangerous time when you're trying to put the pressure at the end of a fight on a puncher. Well, uh, amazingly, Pollard is on record before the fight as having said, it's undoubted that if Nassim catches my man with a clean shot, my guy's going down. I want him to know that. I can tell you this. The corners over there has confused this guy an awful lot. You mean the Prince? Yeah, he's been awfully confused tonight, standing around trying to do what they told him to do. There are a lot of Yorkshiremen in the crowd rooting for Paul Ingle, rooting against Prince Nassim, and Ingle's having his moments again in round number 10. Ingle's like Prince Nassim used to be with Brendan Ingle in the sense that he's listened to the same trainer his whole professional career. The only voice he's ever heard in the corner is Steve Pollard. went down. He was off balance, as is so frequently the case, and Ingle is landing his right-hand shots fairly freely now, as he comes back in the latter stages of the fight. Prince has never been in this kind of a war. Not over a distance, of course, his fight with Kelly was a, a short, intense war. He's got one solid pilot in front of him, that Brian Ingram. It'll be ruled a slip, and round 10 comes to a close. And for showmanship effect, Nassim flips up, or kips up, I should say, from the mat. An old gymnastics move. And Cortez now allows the round to come to a close. Another man is going to the Prince's Corner. His father has some advice for him. getting a little tired, catches that big right hand, shook him, turned his head 90 degrees or more. Round 10, a big round for Paul Ingle, who by CompuBox numbers landed 26 of 68 to 16 of 51 for the Prince and had a 23 to 9 edge in power shots. So the momentum of the bout belongs to the underdog, Paul Ingle, as we go into the championship rounds, 11 and 12. as though the Prince has decided to freeze the ball. Nassim's insurance, he has scored two knockdowns in the bout against Ingle. He's the better boxer, so he should win this fight. And if a knockout presents itself, let it happen. Here's the third knockdown. And Pollard told Ingle it would be dangerous. Two much for Paul Engel in round 11. Way to go. The rough
referee was once again just right on the money. We give the Prince credit. Arguably one of his toughest fights. Pulled it together, did the right thing at the end, and still had enough to knock out an over-eager opponent. Not before a couple of anxious moments, a couple of rousing celebrations for the Ingle Rooters and the crowd. And a longer fight than Naz expected when he told us yesterday, don't blink. But all in all, the power's still there. He knocked Ingle down three times, including the last one that sealed the issue. Let's take another look at the knockout, George, on a perfect left-hand shot. Yeah, it was all about moving around. He got his legs together. This guy walked right into it. Well, I'd like to have seen that a lot earlier. When his legs were moving, he's in charge. Bounce to the left, then throw. Engel, as you've told us so many times, was following a puncher in those last few rounds. Yeah, you got to make sure that <laughs> you keep your chin tucked down, but he hit him on top of the head anyway. So Prince Nassim's vaunted power wins the bout for him as referee Joe Cortez decides that Paul Engel is not safe continuing in the 11th round. He beat the count, but he was still wobbling, and it was the third time in the bout that he'd been down. And he kind of fumbled off the ropes. I think that's what made the difference when he was getting up. His hand slid a little bit off the ropes, and that caused the referee to have more concern. Nassim Hamed seemingly struggling to adapt to a new style, new voices in the corner, and new instructions. Nevertheless, although tasting his own blood, pulls it out. And a new knockout streak has begun. Crowd Ladies got their money's worth. Here's Michael Buffer. Time, we must indeed give our respects to the man who will not have his hand raised first. A round of applause for this challenger from Scarborough who came here tonight and gave it his all. Paul Engel. Referee Joe Cortez, following the knockdown, has to call a halt to the bout. The official time, 45 seconds of round number 11. The winner, and still the undefeated WBO heavyweight champion of the world, Prince Hamzi. Stat numbers from CompuBox, the spirited late round comeback for Ingle, producing somewhat more even numbers than would have been the case in the middle rounds, but Nassim nearly doubling Ingle's total of landed punches and throwing 110 more punches than the challenger and landing at nearly 40% despite throwing very few jabs, almost all power punches. Well, there you have it, 369 power punches. He did throw more jabs than I might have contended would be the case and uh, many more power punches landed 79 of them in fact than was the case for Paul Engel scorecards had Nassim ahead 98-90 98-91 and 98-91 so he had the bout won had it gone the distance and now let's go to Larry Merchant with Prince Nassim congratulations Prince this fight seemed one-sided on the one hand and a little bit harder work than you might have expected on the other. Yeah, I must admit, Larry, it was harder work than I expected, but to tell you the honest truth, when it came to around about round six, I mean, I, I really wanted to take him out early, and I thought that I could. And uh, the second round, I nearly had the job done, but, you know, that's how, that's how God plans it, that's how God plans it. The sixth round, I hurt my hand bad, my left hand, the one that I keep getting the pain with uh, before. I thought it was all right before the fight, which it was. You're saying you re-injured the left hand. How did it happen? Um, I think I hit him with a straight left, around about exactly the same shot that I, that, I take, that I took him out with. And that same shot in the sixth round hurt me really bad. So I had to use one hand for quite a bit, but I still kept throwing it, but it was hurting me. It was hurting, but you know I've got a heart of a lion, Larry. <laughs> you, you were trying some new things. You were hearing new voices in your corner tonight. Can you assess how all of that went? You were trying to be more flat-footed at times, you were moving at times, you were blending the two styles. 
What is they your were, impression? It went brilliant. I think I enjoyed it in there. It was a great workout, and I took some great advice in the corner. I was really comfortable in my corner uh, with um, Oscar Suarez and Emmanuel. It was great. I enjoyed it. But uh, there's still quite a few things I had to learn, and you know, it's my first time my training, only two and a half months, so um, I've got to get used to exact the training how how everything how we want to just go about everything in training because. First yes, time being training new techniques, you know, and I'm but, trying them out. But do you want to wind up having to fight an orthodox fight rather than the unorthodox style, which results in you getting bloody noses and swollen eyes and blood all over your face? As long as you've got a heart of a, of a champion, a heart of a lion, and you come through them, it don't really matter. I mean, you uh, c it, anything could happen as long as end of the day I come through, come through, and I thank God, you know, for giving me the strength to take him out in the 11th round. People have got to realize, fighters have got to realize that I can take you out at any round. Let's go through three of the rounds and the knockdowns in the first round. You tell us what happened then. Were you surprised that he went down that quickly? No, I mean, I caught him with a body shot. We worked on that shot. Uh, Oscar uh, taught me quite a few things with that shot and it came through. Uh, I, I, I knew that the body was hurting him and I've been working to the body, you know. I, for this, probably you, you haven't seen me work to the body as much as this. Uh, and I've been working great to the body. We ask a, a new techniques, and the last knockdown was a, a wicked knockdown. It just, it just timber. It just hit him and in timber. You said that your left hand was hurting you. That you think you may have broken it. Oh, definitely. Yet you stopped him with the left hand. That's what I'm world. saying. Don't matter what I've got. Don't matter what's hurting me. At the end of the day, I've got the heart of a lion. I've got the belief in God. And I go out there and I'll hit you with the hand that's hurting me. I don't really care. It come even the eleventh round. It go to eleventh round. I still take you out. I still win. Who is next on your hit list? Well, you know that I want to unify. I want to become the undisputed featherweight champion in the world because I believe that I am. I'm, I'm the best featherweight in the world, you know. Um, so I want to box a world champion with another belt so I can get another belt. Maybe the WBC, the IBF, or the BA. Any of them because I know I'm going to take them out. Thank you very much, Prince. And again, congratulations. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? 32 and 0, now the record for Prince Nassim with 29 knockouts. He solidifies his status as the number one featherweight in the sport and looks ahead to what we hope will be a future fighting against the other top featherweights. Well, George, you heard Prince Nassim say that he's happy with his new corner. I don't think you're so sure it was such a good thing. Not at all. You know, that one minute that you have is most of all is to rest and refresh yourself. To me, it resembles, and I've been caught up between a, a Ford and a Chevrolet dealership, and both trying to sell me a used car at the same time. That's what his corner resembled tonight. That's going to have to be cleaned up if you want to move on with success. Well, whether coincidence or a legitimate product of Emmanuel Stewart's instructions, Stewart called for straight left hands. He knocked the guy out with a straight left hand. Now, if Emmanuel were to move in and become a fixture in the future, you know Emmanuel well, would it be his instinct? to try to change the fighter, or would he leave him alone? In the end, uh, the, the Prince, he's got this knockout just like he's been getting all other knockouts. It didn't seem like the addition of these guys in minute mounted to much anything. He was able to land a few body punches here and there, something new, but in the end, he won this thing for himself the old way that he's been doing it all along. So he needs those guys for a little input, but too much ya ya in the corner, it's not good. All right, well, we'll see how all of that continues to play out over the future. Upstairs to rejoin us now, Larry Mertzett. And Larry, the Prince told us yesterday that if he won this fight, it would be his goal to go out and seek fights against the three title holders from the more notorious governing organizations and become that rarest of commodities, a unified titleist in his weight class. Shall we believe him? I think we can believe him for a couple of reasons. One is, it is a noble ambition these days to want to do that, to want to fight anyone, anywhere, anytime. And he has shown or said he wanted to do that in the past. At the same time, some cynics, and there are cynics in this game, might say, well, why don't you fight some of the other guys who aren't champions? Now, Espinosa here is the only one of the top featherweights or the ones that are regarded as the most dangerous featherweights, junior or senior, to have a belt. But Barrera is there, Morales is there, and Marquez, a newcomer who is highly regarded, is also there. And after seeing this fight tonight against the relatively unknown, tough but limited angle, you wonder how would he do against those kind of guys. But at the end of the day, what we find out also is that beneath the glitter and the bombast, 
there is a fighter from Sheffield, New Yorkshire, England. A lot of potential opponents for Prince Nassim Hamad, but if the Mexican, Eric Morales, continues to progress the way he has, you have to suspect that somewhere down the road, that's the defining fight, the Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad, if you will, of the featherweight division. We'll wait and see, and we'll hope for such combustion. We'll have a final word on what happened here in the ring in Manchester in just a moment. Right now, let's look ahead. Some upcoming programs here on HBO. Next Saturday on HBO, John Cusack is taking the law into his own hands. And burn it. Until John Goodman is forced to rein him in. Law's a king with me. Then, the stars come out in the lightweight division, Mosley versus Brown, and Ivan Robinson battles Angel Man Freddy. Next Saturday on HBO, it's the premiere of the HBO original movie, The Jack Bullet 8, followed by HBO Boxing After Dark at 11. Next Saturday on HBO. World Championship Boxing returns in May when Oscar De La Hoya, coming off his split decision victory against Ike Quarte, defends his welterweight title versus veteran Oba Carr. Also featured super featherweight champion Floyd Mayweather against Goya Vargas. Then one week later on the 29th, boxing's other premier welterweight champion, Felix Trinidad, last seen in this decisive and dominating victory over Penel Whitaker, meets Vincent Petway. Premiering Tuesday, April 20, will bring you the most recent edition of Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. Some of the stories to be featured. NASCAR. If the numbers say it's the most popular spectator sport in the United States, then why are there so few blacks on the tracks or in the stands? Also, an investigation into the billion-dollar-plus business of counterfeit golf clubs. Plus, a look at pitcher David Cohn, quickly developing into one of baseball's most outspoken citizens. Real sports, where nothing is out of bounds. Earlier this evening, you saw Prince Nassim Hamed maintain his perfect record in the featherweight division, a 32nd consecutive victory, the 29th by knockout. He weathered some difficulties late in the fight to knock Paul Engel down for the third and last time and score the KO in the 11th round. Coming up immediately following tonight's coverage of World Championship Boxing, stay tuned for the last episode this year of The Sopranos. And now for Larry Merchant, George Foreman, and Harold Letterman, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Manchester, England.